Hi, I'm John A. Tech, and I'm extremely pleased to have Karen de la Carrière here. This is the first time we've met before, which was great, but, but I've not interviewed you before. So I'm really thrilled to, to be seeing you. Thank uh, you, John. Thank you. We met in London, was it four years ago? I think it was about We actually had lunch in that big conference table with a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, the amazing author of, what's the book? Russell. Russell, Russell Miller was with us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I worked with Russell throughout Bareface Messiah as his researcher. And my yeah. that's how these yeah. people, Blue, Blue Sky was the foundation upon yeah. which he looked because I couldn't find a publisher. So after he was published, yeah. I then managed to get into print. But yeah. um, he is one of the world's most celebrated biographers. His biography mm -hmm. of uh, Conan Doyle, for example, or, or Hugh Hefner or Getty or. So Ron Hubbard was one of the, the series. And it's a great oh, book. It's still I think. So a piece of blue sky has had a life of its own. <laughs> when, I, when I picked it up, I literally stayed up two o'clock. I mean, it's, it's a nice, easy read, but I could not put it down. It was riveting. Oh, well, thank you. I think we should... I'll be promoting this show to at least 22 Facebook groups, all of X, X, <laughs> and I'm going to, uh, uh, let, is it available on Amazon? Yeah, it, we, we reissued it because when it was first published, we had to paraphrase 60 of Hubbard's most private statements, his harassment orders, his journals and his letters, mm -hmm. because of a strange situation in American law. In 2018, we brought out the unexpurgated version, which has all 60 of those quotations back and about oh. four more for good. Oh. But mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's called Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky now. There is still a pirate edition that's called A Piece of Blue Sky, but that's the original mm -hmm. book. And I want nothing to do with the people who are trying to steal it from me. Yeah, I heard you didn't get any royalties. I got you some. The I got some. Oh, I got some. But it went bestseller. It went number 98 out of 4 million books at Amazon. And I didn't get anything from that period. Jeez. Jeez. And well, you were the godfather. There have been books and books and books, but you stuck your neck out in the early days, right? It, it, that was very brave of you. Oh, thank very you. Very brave. It, this, that means this week I've been called the original gangster on Leo yeah. Remini's show and the Godfather. Yeah. What does this tell us? <laughs> yeah. But, you but were it, brave, John. You were I, brave. I, it, I never really thought about it. Some, some, I think Leo asked me in the podcast they've just put up on Fair Game um, why I did it. And in the end, I just had to say, oh, I'm pig headed. <laughs> That's it. You know, I, I yeah. and it took me ages after I left because I was nine years in. I did OT5 as a class two auditor, did the data series evaluators course, Dynetic yes. Auditor, Method One Auditor, all that stuff. Totally believed in it, absolutely, through that time, never on staff. And when I left, it was like, well, this is wrong and they've done the wrong things. And of course, somebody has to stand up and say this. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what the Guardian's office were going to do in response. And I couldn't understand why all of these people I was talking to were so scared. These people who'd done these OT levels and you know mm. been at high, been commanding officers of various organisations, and they were oh no, I'm not going to say anything. And mm. I did, I just didn't understand it. And mm. at first, I thought, well, it's because they know what the Guardian's office will do, and you'll be harassed. But then I came to something else, and it, this was quite some time afterwards. I heard this this expression, total convert. And I realized that because I was never on staff, I was never abused or humiliated. And I also realized that of the thousand or so Scientologists I've talked to, I can't think of anyone else that's true for. Everybody else I know was crush regged into, you know, selling something they didn't have, borrowing money, or, or they were treated as a slave in the C organization. Or, you know, um, when I came to, I, I helped uh, put together the Leite case in 1984, the famous child custody case in England. And I, I happened to know Jay Hurwitz. And so I said to the, the couple who were doing it, oh, Jay will come and testify because he had been the business partner 
of the father of the children, David Banks, who I think I can name now without anything happening too badly. And David Banks, and I don't think this has ever been publicly said, he'd said in sworn statements to the court that um, he thought disconnection was a dreadful thing. You know, he didn't agree with this. And Jay came along and gave me a letter that David Banks had written saying that they could put a partition up the staircase and through the office so they'd never have to actually see each other. This is how much he didn't believe in disconnection. But when I told the stepfather of the kids, Jay Hurwitz will come along, he blanched. He was scared. And I was sort of, what, what's going on? He said, I, I worked for Jay. And the last time I saw him, he pushed me up against the wall and threatened to punch me, you know. And those kind of pressures, this, these, this never happened to me. So I was foolish enough to be able to speak out against it. And after that, it was, I think Jeffrey has the same thing that I have. You've just got to know the answer. You've started asking these questions. What was Hubbard really doing? What was this all about? You know, and, and I went on to 96, then I left, then I came back in 2013 and started writing for Tony Ortega's Bunker because I realized that most people don't really escape, that the way of thinking is so overwhelming that even though they've got rid of, you know, they're not talking about the overt motivator sequence anymore. Now they're talking about karma. And if they've read anything about it, they're talking about karma vipaka, but we won't get into that. But they're still thinking. This is still the, the way the universe is. And of course it isn't. Alvin Hubbard's perception of the universe was the perception of a narcissist, you know, and it was all about him trying to desperately cure all of these things that were wrong with him, which he lists in great detail in Dianetics and Modern Science of Mental Health. Asthma, short-sightedness, bursitis. I'd never heard of bursitis before, but he had it in the right shoulder. You know, there's a bursa there between the muscle and the bone and it wasn't working properly and it never did. And of course he never stopped being short-sighted. He never overcame his asthma. But I think he was also trying to deal with his own desperate psychiatric condition. Yeah. And we just got, you know, we became part of that solipsistic mess that was the ego of L. Ron Hubbard. But I, I'm not here to... to no, no, I love it. I love when you're on a roll. I prefer interviews that go like this and it, yeah. it gets an energy going. Hmm. I will, I want to say two things. Yeah. One is there are people like you <laughs> in Scientology slang, if I, a kick-ass Satan. Kick ass means you kick ass or arse, as they say in England. <laughs> that doesn't sound right when you but say the, that, it does it. But why do you do that? I'll tell you why. What is really important, I'm being evaluative. I can evaluate. And now, yeah. You pursue truth and you like to uncover lies. I'm dialed into you. And I really read you what is important to you, what is a wanted within your soul is to just disintegrate fake falsehoods. And that's probably why the book, I want to sell you a piece of blue sky, came forth because you saw lies. And I think it's so important in your heart to reveal truth. Am I? <laughs> Not only truth, actual <laughs> knowledge, wisdom, fact. Did I read you well there? I, 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 gotta, I gotta tell you, somebody posted your SB Declare on Outer Banks. Was it Outer Banks or X under? And it was a hoot to read. Not only in those days they were more daring with their SPD as a person, but they said, if you connect with John, if you are friendly with him, you too will get. Do you know they put that in your SPD clan that just connect? Well, you must have seen it, right? It's been There's a while. Friend. It's been a while. <laughs> what a hoot. It was just laughable. They don't now. They don't even send you your SP to come Oh, no. I, I, it's hidden in HCO and under lock and key. Yeah. So you, you're 
an uncoverer of lives. What I, I really dialed into you, John, you, if you get an opportunity, that's why you interview people like me. You want to continue to unpeel and undress and unveil the packages of lies. And there are a lot of lies in Scientology, a lot of lies. May I respond to you on one nice issue you brought up, which is why people cling on and are so indoctrinated. I want to give you, uh, I, want to, I want to toss it, actually, I want your response to my response. Of course, yeah. It has been said that people will suffer a humongous amount of pain for a little piece of pleasure. And what I want to tell you is in very early Scientology, you can get a win. A win. It's not sustainable, doesn't last, you can crash and burn next week. <clears throat> but in that little win, people get hooked and they want to replicate that win. So if they go into debt for $100,000 to have three L's, whose results are temporary, not sustainable, and they crash and burn and they divorce their wife six months later and they go bankrupt, blah, 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 blah. but they want, they're hooked up on the win. They want that few moments of win. Can you say something? <coughs> Can you respond to that? Absolutely. You're quite, you're absolutely right. <coughs> but it, it's what Abram Maslow, the psychologist, called a peak experience. And you, if you talk, I've uh -huh. talked with people who, for example, took LSD, yeah. when that was a popular thing to do. Yeah. And they had a peak experience and they wanted to repeat that. They wanted yes. to do that. Again. Yes. Worse yet, if they took cocaine. <laughs> They, they can become yeah. addicted to it. And I started quite soon after I left looking at Scientology as, as a process of addiction. That you have, a, you know, a, um, yeah. Yeah. very good indicators, VGIs, this idea yeah. of euphoria that, that you become, yes. Yes. You feel yes. well, that feeling, as you say, you want to repeat that, you want to get to it again. What I found when I was, when I, first left almost everybody I talked to and I talked to hundreds of people I'd say what was the first win what was the first peak experience when did you have it it'd usually be on training routines very often on training routines yes, yes. and mm -hmm. I knew about that because I was I'd done I'd studied Zen meditation before Scientology so I know if you fix your attention you get what's called mm -hmm. the Gansfeld effect you will start mm -hmm. to you know to have distortions of perception and then your brain will start to fill in hallucinations you'll start to see things but you'll also start getting a feeling of euphoria so i knew mm. all about that i'd been doing you know before i got to scientology yeah. the yeah. other place where people would very often have a win would be in a book one session or in an yeah. early auditing session and mm. the same was true for me for me it was a self-analysis session i had where you just feel fantastic and you think that that feeling fantastic belongs to the process or procedure, whereas in fact it belongs to you. It, yeah. It's your thing. <laughs> and right it, on. You're hooked, you know. It's a, you can go to a casino and you can win half a million dollars one night. And boy, the casino laughs at you because you'll be back and yeah, every right. dollar of that half a million will be given back because the euphoria you feel on the win of getting half a million dollars for no work at all. You just want to repeat that. You believe you are invincible enough to recreate that. So you give it right back. So there's this involuntary replication when you were saying how people just keep believing, even when their family is destroyed, that disconnected, they're broke because they've given every last dime, taken out a second mortgage on their home, and they still want to be loyal to Hubbard? Mm -hmm. 
it's this euphoria that they cannot forget. And they believe that continuing no matter what hardship will replicate that euphoric happiness. They yearn for it. And I know that because the arguments I get when people, I, I'm friendly with a lot of people who are still half in, half out. And, you know, they debate me and they, they reprimand me for my video channel and think it's not fair that I say bad things about Harvard and that, 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 that. we get into discussion. No matter what hardship, no matter what penalty, I was talking to an OT8 who has incredible body, body problems. Just his body is falling apart. And I said to him, but Dianetics says you won't even get a common cold after Dianetics. And look at you, OT8, you've given them a million dollars. I'm in better health than you. I run three miles a day at my age and you doing auditing your BTs and your entities every day, every day, every day. Look at <laughs> can't, can't, can't get him to see, can't get him to see. He fervently believes. And that's because he says, Karen, haven't you had wins? He keeps harping on the fact that you have that peak that you talked about. So to try and understand the mind of a dedicated loyal Scientologist is, although people do reach a threshold, don't you agree? And then they depart. Everybody will take that much. The, yeah, and, it, and it's a matter of peeling the onion and taking the layers off until they get there. I mean, with most of us, the process was that the organization was too harsh. That was where it starts for most people, that the organization is just nasty. When I, in 1982, saw the name David Miscavige for the first time, it was in a, a newsletter that had been published with a picture of him poking a finger at somebody. And under, underneath it said that he was going to be tough and ruthless. And mm. that, was, that was it for me. Tough, I didn't mind. <laughs> ruthless, without ruthless. mercy. Yeah. <laughs> you know where where does that's not you know compassion is is a significant aspect of life but you use the word fervent and i think that really homes in on it you've you've met my very good friend and colleague Yuval Laor who has been spent the last 25 years developing an analysis of how people become drawn into groups mm. and he's made all sorts of interesting distinctions one of them is that some people are high fervor some people mm. are low fervor. That mm. doesn't mean that they won't stick to the thing. It just means they won't make as much noise about it. People have mm. an experience of awe or wonder. Something happens which is inexplicable mm. to them. It, you know, and, and they then believe that the source of that is to be believed about everything. So, mm. yes, there is that plain contradiction. If, if you say... I remember the first time I met Jerry Armstrong back in 1984 and that three burly XC organization people there were going, you're working for the CIA. And they, you could see <laughs> they meant him harm. And there's Jerry sitting there, not noticing anything of it and just having a discussion. He said, show me a clear, show me anybody that's achieved. Now, of course, I got into the deep history of this. Hubbard claims to have, I think, 270 cases. By the time he writes Dianetics, he says he's cleared 270 people. Now, mm -hmm. what happened to those people? Not one of them has ever come forward. Mm -hmm. What we do know is that among those people, the people he'd treated, many of them complained about what had happened. So Dr. Joseph Winter, who'd worked with him on mm -hmm. the book, when Art Sepos, who published the book for the medical publisher Hermitage House, decided it was a fraud, which was, it was published Ooh, by, no. by the October. The publisher said, I'm withdrawing it. It's a fraud. And mm. he commissions Dr. Joe Winter to write a book that says, There's, there might be some value in Dianetics, but Hubbard is a con man. Mm. And 
yeah, I interviewed uh, by by mail. I interviewed Don Rogers, who wrote the appendix to the original Dynetics, which stayed in the book to, until the 1980s. And Don was on the board of every foundation until 1954, and there were several of them. And he still really liked Hubbard. You know, 30 years later, he's writing me. He's got nothing against Hubbard at all. Um, but he did point one thing out, which seemed mind-boggling to me. He said, when Art Seppos came along and said, oh, OK, I'll commission you to write this book. Hubbard turned to me and he said, you know, deep trans hypnosis isn't very popular. We're going to have to find another method. Mm. There was mm. no research. Mm. He went from having hypnotized people and there are letters where he talks about this. Yes. You know, there's the famous 1949 letter to his agent, mm. Forry Ackerman, which Tony yeah. has published. I've had all these letters for years. I didn't realize how desperately people needed to get them. I've got a huge collection of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. In this letter to Fari Ackerman, written from Savannah, Georgia, Hubbard mm -hmm. says he's found a way of raping women mm -hmm. and they will not know that they've been raped. He doesn't talk about helping anybody. Mm -hmm. And then he decides he'll use the reverie or light trans method um, and you get Dianetics. No research, no 270 clears, no anything. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. when I talked with Mike Rinder the other week, he was, you know, the introspection rundown was researched on Bruce Welsh. That's mm. the, I'm going, but medical research is a thousand cases, the gold mm. standard. One Clinical case. trials. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, <laughs> good points. Excellent points. Mike Rinder and I go back 40, 45 years. And I was right there when he talked about I was telling Jeffrey, I'm going to dream about that stoning of the ship. I was right there, uh, as Mike explained. And I'd like to just add to this That's great it. podcast you did with Mike Rinder. He's a dear, dear close friend of mine. Mm. He's the first person I call on. <laughs> Mike, it's me. <laughs> um, he, he actually played a big part in transitioning me out of out of it all, mm. you know, he was talking to me back channels. And I had an OSA intelligence guy show up at my door and said, Karen, you're talking to Mike Rinder. This is irrevocable. Mm. If you don't immediately cease, you will be declared suppressive person. And I barked at him. How do you know? Are you stealing phone records? How do you know? Mike Rinder is in Florida, the other end. Of, how do you know? And he was evasive and he said, we, we have PIs. And they knew that privately I was talking to Mike Rinder towards the last few weeks of me being in the cult. They knew it because they do buy phone records. Now, of course, we talk on WhatsApp and other modality. There's no phone record. <laughs> you talk on, there's many ways to talk without any phone record, which is. I want to tell you just a little more. Oh, that smelly men's dorm reminded me. I was considered elite as a class 12. So I was in a woman's dorm of only eight that was instead of being with 22 smelly bodies i was only with eight because there was a class 12 eight, eight, six, six eight. people he said there was maybe yes. 60 people in just there. a slither of a bunk bed that was your space yeah and you know when you ran down different stairways sometimes odor would waft upward and if you went anywhere near the men's dorm the smell and the stink and this sort of registered as, how can this be? How can this be the flagship Apollo? The ideal with, theme. Yeah. And it crawled with roaches. Mike didn't get into that. They, you would have something called roach derby. Yeah. And the roach derby meant everybody was commandeered to go find a roach. If you found a roach's nest of eggs, you got $1. But if you found only one roach, you got 50 cents. You literally could cash out. They were so desperate because every time supplies came aboard, the fruit, the vegetables, 
more roaches would come in from these Mediterranean. Th so we lived with roaches. Not only did we live with smells, we lived with roaches. I'm just telling you what the Apollo Hubbard, of course, had cleaners that sanitized his quarters morning, noon, and night, his messenger. So he lived in an ivory palace within the Apollo. But Tom, Dick, and Harry. <laughs> so Bruce Welch. Mm. He actually, this is the young Mike Rinder. It was almost, as he explained, he was still a teenager. 18. This was one of his first assignments. He had to stand outside Bruce Welch's cabin while Bruce screamed. He, he could practically rattle the nearby cabins with his roar of insanity. And Mike had to bodyguard outside eight hours a day listening to a madman. From midnight to 8 a.m. The young Mike Rinder, 18 years old, doing this. Hubbard decided to be a pen pal. And although no one could talk to Bruce Welch, they would exchange little private notes and letters. And this became a huge case history, which we had to study every morning. At eight o'clock, there was muster. Jeff Walker was the, did the roll call. And then we had to study how Hubbard changed a lunatic into a sane man. And it started off with these little pen. Bruce would write back, and then Hubbard would write back to Bruce, and then Hubbard. And this was all shoved down, no, no personal contact, shoved under the door. And Hubbard's first question was, just before you decided to kill me, what happened in your mind? <laughs> so Bruce Welch was the case history that then started L11, which basically L11's key question is, what evil purpose do you have? This, this is all a migration of, but I will tell you, John, when you're on the high seas, having someone with an intent to kill is scary because you can't throw them in the ocean if you have any humanitarian kindness in your heart. So you're, you're on a confined space with a killer roaming around. I think he grabbed a machete from the galley. Mike didn't mention that before he was they locked him down in this cabin, but he was completely, he wasn't just a silent madman. He was a roaring, want to kill madman. <laughs> and we studied, we were electrified every morning to study what Hubbard and Bruce Welch, it was like a, talk about it, an ongoing, this was an electrifying, real life psycho TV show mm -hmm. right on the Apollo. Yeah. And Mike Rinder <laughs> was right there bodyguarding Bruce and listening to his roaring screams eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. And we studied every inch of it. Now, when you're on the high seas, I can understand incarceration and lockdown was needed. But to make this a, a selling rundown, when you're grounded on the base, what is the need for lockdown? You're not on a ship, you're not on the high seas. There's no dangerous killer roaming around. So they transported what was done in one emergency situation on a ship and then made this a repeated rundown till the Lisa McPherson debacle. I mean, even to this day, did you know, did Jeffrey tell you there are four contracts you have to sign before getting any service in the seal? There are four contracts. It now becomes like two inches thick of papers you have to sign in the, before they'll even audit you. And one of them is you give them permission 
to do the introspection right now. You give them complete and utter that if you have a mental breakdown, you're going to do what they say. You're going to. Do the, I don't have all the wording, but I know you're going to be interviewing Jeff again. You got. You need to explore these four contracts. They get off the hook because you sign that your mental health will be completely, utterly in their ability to rule the waves. Anyway. It, <laughs> that was a very good interview. Thank you for getting getting Mike Rinder to really tell you. And you see Bruce Welch, he took a little bits and pieces and made it L11. Mm -hmm. So all these people that rushed to L11, this came from handling a madman. <laughs> L11's roots and ancestor is simply the Bruce Welch coupled together. What have you done? What have you withheld? What even purpose? This is this is L11. It's the story of a madman called, and you now pay something like twenty thousand dollars. But you're not the madman, and you don't have an urge to kill L. Ron Hubbard. But that's L11. And as as far as we know, Bruce Welsh was offloaded as fast as possible, and we have no idea about his mental health. My presumption, having had to deal with people who have had psychotic episodes as a consequence, particularly of OT3. Um, I was called in by the um, mental health asylum that is closest to St. Hill in, in Sussex. And I was astonished, this was many years ago in the early 1990s. I was astonished, 14 people turned up to hear me talk. Now I know these people work crazy hours, very long hours. Why on earth would 14 of them care enough, doctors, nurses, mm -hmm. to try and understand what was happening? Well, it was because every year they had two or three people coming from St. Hill who had mm -hmm. gone completely crazy. They just had a guy who had basically ripped his clothes off, tried to attack everybody, smeared his excrement all over the walls, and they just had to leave him there. And these people... You know, these terrible psychs, these awful, evil people who are trying to destroy L. Ron Hubbard and the universe and all life, they really wanted to know how they could help these people, what they could do. And, it, you know, so one of the things that I learned from them, because there were a number of times when, you know, people were sent to me by psychiatrists because they didn't know what to do with them. But one of the things I learned from them is that psychosis is cyclical. Yes. It isn't, you're always in the mm -hmm. So what happened to Bruce Welsh was that the episode went, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that it will have come back. It may yes. not have been Hubbard he wanted to kill then, it may have been someone else. It may not have been Hubbard in the first place. 